Now, as far as the uh, nuclear weapons program, such as it ever existed before 2003 or up to and including 2003, is all this information just from that laptop, or is there something else I'm missing here? I mean, I know that they got, they went to the black market in order to get some of the equipment that they needed in order to have a nuclear program, but none of that was really in violation of their uh, safeguards agreement or their signature to the nonproliferation treaty. And well, so, technically it would be because they're obtaining that from, from other countries who already had sanctions against them or, you know, were sort of, I mean, getting something clandestinely off of a black market is not exactly on the up and up. I mean, this is the very same stuff that they're spinning under the presence of IAEA inspectors at Natanz and, and working at Boucher and all this stuff, right? I mean, this is the very same stuff that they're using now above board. Well, now, but they, the inspectors were after the fact, though, and IAEA presence was after the fact. It was that they said, we'd like to do this, you know, and went through normal venues, you know, went and purchased materials, you know, off the global market, purchased technology off the global market. Which, of course, I mean, they weren't was, allowed to do. I mean, Clinton they wouldn't let the Chinese to, or the Russians. That. That's what the problem is. That's why there's so much mistrust, is that they didn't go about it that way. Yeah. It was discovered after the fact, and then all of a sudden, the IAEA inspectors were invited in. I see. Well, so is there anything else, though, that would indicate that it's actually a, that they ever had a weapons program besides that laptop? Um, I mean, unless new evidence is, is uncovered or, you know, I mean, a lot of, I think, you know, what's helpful is most, what, what's most helpful beyond the laptop is actually the answers and the documents produced by Iran for the International Atomic Energy Agency under that August 2007 modality, um, you know, because that really revealed um, I think in a lot of ways, a little bit about how the black market works, about who's operating, you know, and, and that could be helpful, you know, for, for counterproliferation beyond just Iran, but and, and to other countries, too, if there's more access to those individuals who are operating in the black market. And, and could, you know, I mean, I think that actually provided a number of leads. But really, other than that laptop, I have not seen other substantial evidence. Now, there may be some that, that hasn't been presented that essentially is the core of the case against Iran. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I don't know whether you have a comment on this or not, but I feel that I have to go ahead and bring this up as long as we're talking about this laptop, that it came from the National Council for Resistance in Iran, which is the political front for the Mujahideen al khalq and which is widely known to be also a front for Israeli intelligence. I don't know of any reason to believe this laptop even came from inside the borders of Persia at all. Do you? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard question, and, and you know, I think the the source is of serious consideration. I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, the the Mujahideen is actually on the state sponsor of terrorism list. Um, you know, th when they came out in 2002 with allegations about Iran's nuclear program, it ended up being true because Iran did have a secret nuclear program at that time. So at least, it, at least in part their allegations were true. You know, whether or not the laptop is fabricated is, again, it's anyone's guess. And so that why, you know, that's why it would be extremely helpful if, if Iran were to be proactive and, and provide a lot more intelligence about uh, what is, you know, the, the evidence being presented from that laptop. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you, but I hate to think that the burden of proof is really on them when the IAEA, you know, and the CIA and everybody says that they have no evidence of any weapons program. It sort of seems like the burden needs to shift here to our side. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I understand I mean, what you're the, saying, the, the though. The reality it would be helpful, is, though, no is doubt. that we're at a standoff. And I think that, and unfortunately, the nuclear program has really become one of the issues front and center for, for really what is a, a broader range of issues dating back to really uh, the 1950s between the U.S. and Iran. I think that the nuclear issue is being, you know, really promulgated as, as sort of the core of tensions when it, when it isn't. You know, it is one thing that the U.S. and the West is using politically against Iran, um, but I think it, you know, is much more about um, uh, the, the strained relations between the United States and Iran uh, that dates back more than a half a century. Right, yeah, I think that's probably true. I know that's what Scott Ritter says in his book, Target Iran, that regime change is the policy and disarmament is simply the excuse. In fact, this was something that uh, Robert Dreyfus brought up Friday in his argument that now we're not going to have a war was that, come on, the Israelis are smart. They know just as well as you know that the Iranians are enriching, enriching to 3.6 percent in the presence of IAEA safeguard inspectors and so forth. They know that. They're not really going to have a war over a 3.6 percent U-235 uh, enrichment program. 
Well, I, I don't put it past them because if you look at what happened in Syria, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't put it past them. I'm sorry. Like, you know, I, again, I don't know what the chances are that there is actually going to be a military attack, whether it's the U.S. or Israel, before, you know, the end of this year or in the next 12 months or whatever. Um, but what I can say is that of any country in the Middle East, you know, Israel has proactively attacked nuclear reactors that were used specifically for for power, but also even, you know, in unknown cases, such as most recently this, this Syria in, in the case of the Al-Kabar facility, and whether or not, you know, that actually was a reactor, I think is still of, of some debate. But more than any other country, Israel has used preventive military strikes and made the case that, you know, that those countries were going to, you know, use those facilities to create nuclear weapons to threaten Israel. Um, so you look at the Osirak reactor uh, that, that Israel bombed uh, in Iraq, for example, you know, as, as another example of that. Right. In fact, it's a kind of a funny footnote that Iraq didn't have a nuclear weapons program at all before that, and it was IAEA safeguarded, inspected, and everything like that until they bombed it. Then they began their underground nuclear weapons program that was discovered during the Gulf War or at the end of the Gulf War. Absolutely, and and certainly before the the bombing, you know, that reactor was not being used to create nuclear weapons or or massive amounts of highly enriched uranium. Well, that was a long time ago. Who can remember all those details? I'm sure it was probably justified when they did it. Come on. All right. No. So now I want to point out one thing I really like about your blog here. It's IranNuclearWatch.blogspot.com. And up at the top, you have a picture of uh, a big Iranian and a big American standing with their arms folded and their backs to each other. And yet at their feet, I take it, those guys are the state. And at their feet are us regular people. And they're all standing around shaking hands and being friends. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to ask you about this, uh, this outreach that you're doing between civilians. Uh, I, I know that you have something to do with uh, that red phone thing that they did, right, where uh, American and uh, Iranian civilians got to talk to each other over the red phones? Yes, absolutely. Um, we co-organized that with um, Nick Jalen, who's with the Nasir campaign, and he was really sort of the genius behind, you know, doing these red phones, and we've been talking about it for, you know, almost a couple of years, actually, um, and he did, you know, he did them on a smaller scale in, in New York and, and Boston, and then, you know, I asked him about coming to D.C. and, and um, you know, doing this with the Campaign for a New American Policy on Iran. And so we set up these phones for members of Congress, Hill staffers, foreign policy community, um, anyone uh, just even walking along the streets along the Capitol. And we had, you know, over 50 conversations between American citizens and Iranians in D.C. And the, the whole point of it was, you know, to really have an exercise in, in civilian diplomacy. And the, the reality is that, the United States and Iran haven't talked for more than 30 years has really complicated matters and, and, and then only made things worse. And we really need to start talking to each other. And if we normal citizens can do it, certainly, you know, our government should be doing it. Well, now, there was some news, wasn't there, recently that the State Department is going to try to open some kind of office or another in Tehran. And yet you wrote on your blog that uh, – this actually foretold uh, bad circumstances rather than an increasing of, of regular civilian relations. How's that? Yeah, you know, I, I titled that a diplomatic overture question mark, and I really I thought about it later. I said, really, I should have called that a diplomatic underture. You know, <laughs> I mean, immediately after this was announced or, or leaked to the media, because it wasn't really announced, but it was leaked to the media, and, you know, one State Department official said, you know, oh, this is meant to undermine the regime in Iran, and we're going to use it to reach out to dissidents and students and, and others inside of Iran. And I have to chuckle at that because, you know, I mean, you certainly would not make some sort of announcement to the media that that's what the intention of this is, because the Iranians have to approve it anyway. You know, so it really undermines the the efforts from the get-go. But but also, you know, there there are logistic things, you know, in regards to actually setting up a, a visa office. And this was, you know, the, the office would likely be set up at the Swiss embassy and would have, you know, probably three of our foreign service officers there. Um, and they would be processing visas. You know, they're certainly not going to have time, you know, with all of the administrative things that they're going to have to do, they're not going to have time to go out and be reaching out to dissidents. So, I mean, the, the logistics of it is, is also laughable. But, you know, they, they undermine themselves from the get-go on this, and, and it, it's really disappointing because this really could have been something credible and a, 
and, and a wonderful opening, you know, particularly as a gesture to the people of Iran who would use that, you know, use the intersection to file for visas to come to the United States. And, and, and it really would enhance our cultural exchanges. 